Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. Yes, nothing's too expensive here on the EEV blog to take apart. So we have the Agilent 4000 series, a brand new released today. Bit of a world exclusive. You know what we say here on the EEV blog, don't turn it on, take it apart. Now, if you've seen my review of this thing, you'll know that it's essentially a 3000 X series, but with the touchscreen as well. So really, I'd expect uh, uh, there to be a different layout board, of course, because it's physically a much larger unit to the 3000X, but uh, its architecture should essentially be pretty identical. I'd be surprised if they've uh, changed much to this thing at all. So it looks like uh, to get into here, we've got uh, two carry strap uh, torque screws on here, because that would go right through to the metal uh, shielding. It'll be all metal shielded on the back here. We've got three main screws here and the feet on the side as well. So let's uh, take those off and the plastic back panel should just pop out because the uh, I don't have to take off these nuts. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't have to take those off yet. So it should just pop out and get bare metal. Let's go. And there you have it, we have the obligatory uh, shielding on this thing, and yes, it is a beautiful piece of work. No problem at all, look at the beautiful little uh, mount there for the side uh, stand on this thing. So this thing really is built like the proverbial brick dunny. I like it. Now it does appear like this power supply cover slides up like that but I I can't get the thing to can't get it to budge so I'm not not quite sure hmm we are in there's a couple of little niggly connectors under here but in like Flynn and of course the first thing you'll notice is that the power supply is completely shielded inside here here's the uh, front panel power switch which goes uh, straight through to the front panel and down onto the board down there. Yes, it uh, is a uh, soft uh, power switch, I believe, just like the 3000X, but look, it's very well shielded, incredibly well shielded. We've got a fan cable and main power, and uh, that, I'm not sure what that is, um, some sort of standby thing. So there you go, very well shielded power supply. We'll take a look at that later, but what we're interested in is this lovely main board. Mm. And as expected, it is very similar to the 3000X. The architecture, pretty much exactly the same. We've got our four analog input cans here. We've got our two mega zoom uh, four ASICs, one per sharing two channels. We've got one AD, well, the one ADC uh, BGA package sharing two channels here. And that's why the memory and sample rate halves when you switch on two channels or one and two or three and four. I mean, if you switch on one and three or two and four or something, you get the full memory and full sample rates because they're shared between the one mega zoom four ASIC. And they've got the huge ADC there. Um, it looks like that they have a higher spec oscillator in there. It looks like higher spec. I haven't actually checked out the specs. It just doesn't look like a standard uh, package. That's all. Um, so possibly with the uh, uh, 10 megahertz output here, um, and input, they've specced in better oscillator. Perhaps, I don't know, we'll have to check it out. Um, we've got our backup battery, we've got our Spear 600 um, uh, processor from ST, it's exactly the same. We've got our Xilinx F support FPGA here, and uh, well, digital inputs, some circuitry will be on the bottom side there, the, LAN, uh, the VGA is built in, and uh, looks like we've got display going off here, and another possible uh, that could be keyboard. So apart from that, um, it's all pretty much the same. There seems to be a little bit more there, but uh, like the architecture is practically identical. And if we check out between the two ADCs here, you'll notice there's a couple of unpopulated footprints, a rather large-ish uh, BGA there, and another couple of small uh, leadless chip uh, ones just like this one here, so we'll have to take a look at that, but I don't remember there being any unpopulated ones like that 
on the 3000X. So um, they've tried to add something extra there, but decided that they didn't want it. Maybe it's in the higher end uh, model. I'm not sure, but I can't see why it would be because everything's handled in the Mega Zoom 4 ASIC. And clearly they've uh, got more circuitry around here. This is for the dual arbitrary uh, waveform capabilities. So there's basically two identical channels there, whereas there was only one in the 3000X. And it looks like we've got exactly the same uh, Spear 600 ARM processor as before, but as you can see, the Xilinx Spartan is an XC3S 1600E, whereas we had only the 1200E in the 3000X. So they've decided to add some increased uh, logic density there to that FPGA. And this 4000X does have, of course, the uh, touch zone uh, triggering capability, which the 3000X didn't, but whether or not that is related to that higher density uh, Spartan there, I got no idea. I'm not sure if this will show up on camera, but you can probably see a little bit of residue left on that board where it hasn't been cleaned properly. Not a huge deal, I suspect. Now, but I don't particularly like that uh, ball solder joint on that BNC connector there, but that's fairly typical of uh, this new lead-free rubbish and uh, high thermal mass um, items like that big BNC connector. And I love how you can actually see the wires wound on these SMD chip output inductors there. Look at that, beautiful. Have a quick look at the power supply stuff. They got all coil craft inductors there, very nice. There's the backlight supply up there. It's all labeled nicely, plus 13 volts, plus 3.3, plus one volts. And if we go down a bit, we have even more rails, plus 1.8. Look at all the via stitching there going through to the inner uh, power plane where it would be distributed over to the uh, FPGAs and other stuff that ASICs that actually require that. We've got one volt, we've got 1.2 volts here, we've got 14 volts here, 1.8 volts, 2.5 volts, oh man, another 12 volt supply, ah, oh, voltage is all over the shop, 1.4 volts down here, man, more voltage rails than you can poke a stick at, but very typical in these uh, system designs. Oh, and we have a traditional 5 volt one, there we go, look at that, beautiful, 5.2 over here, check that out. And there's the main 10 megahertz oscillator and it's a Raycon brand uh, TX0220. Now, I had a quick look at the Raycon uh, website and of course, basically being TX, that means uh, temperature compensated uh, crystal oscillator. So um, I could only find the 2200, which was a 0.5 uh, ppm to two and a half ppm temperature compensated oscillator. So I'm not sure exactly if it's the uh, same one or not. I don't think so, but I think it's better than your usual, you know, five by eight millimeter um, package. It's certainly a different package to uh, normal anyway. So they might have a uh, better 10 megahertz reference oscillator in this thing compared to the 3000X. Now I just wanted to show you this because I can with my uh, times 10 macro lens here, you can see the balls on that, you can see the solder balls on the pads of that unpopulated BGA, which I showed you before, that was between the two ADCs. Check it out. And there's a better angle on that, I think. Beautiful. And as we saw in the 3000, actually you can't escape having a good old LM324 in there. And look at that, 74HCT04 as well. Ah, TL072, it's all happening. That is around the circuitry for the uh, demo output signal. So we've got some uh, AD822 op amps there and some DG444 muxes and all that fun stuff which goes with having those analog output signals. There's the two outputs down there. And what do you know? Someone's gone to the trouble to measure that battery and mark the value on there. 3.197. Got to have three decimal places. All right, let's lift this board out of here and ta-da, we're out. Look at that, beautiful. 
And here's the back side of the board, which is actually the front side facing you when you're operating the scope. So we've got our four analog inputs down here. We've got our two demo signal outputs here, USB, and our two uh, arbitrary waveform gens plus external trigger input. So, you know, clearly the circuitry is all functional. It's right where it should be. And this is the four channel version, of course, but it is available in the two channel version. And presumably that's why they've got a separate bracket for each lot of two channels. They just wouldn't populate all those components there on the dual channel version, I would presume, um, because you wouldn't waste the money, I guess, or maybe it is populated and they don't put the BNCs on. I don't know. Um, anyway, you know, there's a fair bit of circuitry on the bottom for the uh, demo output signals, of course. There's our USB uh, controller chip for our two USB hosts there, plus uh, there'll be a third one. Uh, so that'll be like a three channel or four channel one as well. Um, and that's our external trigger circuitry around there. Then we've got uh, just uh, some support and bypass um, stuff for our dual arbitrary waveform gen there. Most of the circuitry for that is on the other side of the board as we uh, saw before. More of the power supply stuff, ton of it all around there on the back side of the board as well. You can see all the bypassing on the back of uh, the big BGA devices. That's our processor, that's our FPGA. Uh, these are our two MegaZoom 4 ASICs and these are our two ADCs. And uh, up the top here, we've got a couple of custom Agilent chips for the logic analyzer, a couple of uh, interface devices there and well, just regular support stuff and lots of bypassing and things on the back, maybe some localized, more localized power and things like that. Now, one interesting difference from the 3000, I believe, is that the logic analyzer here is now using some custom Agilent chips there. Well, they're, you know, they might be off the shelf, but they're certainly uh, branded Agilent devices there. And they didn't have that on the 3000. So you can see the uh, logic analyzer header connector up the top here and these two custom devices. So maybe that goes um, a little bit um, of the way towards explaining the uh, extra cost for the logic analyzer on this thing. But like it's more than like doubles, like two and a half times the cost of the logic analyzer add-on for the 3000, which is crazy, but it certainly is different. Now here's the analog uh, front end here. We've got an additional relay on the top. There is another identical looking relay uh, on the top side um, underneath the metal shielded can. And it looks like uh, there's like the main uh, amplifier, I'd say, is around there. Uh, the main uh, driver, sorry, which then drives the uh, differential output up into the ADC further up. Um, so it's all the bypass stuff around there. So most of the active stuff uh, on that thing is on the top side of the board. And then we've got the demo signal outputs there. There's a DG419, which is a, a precision uh, analog switch there. I'm not sure what the device is above it, but uh, once again, most of the stuff is on the top side of the board for those demo signals. And I'm not sure what that particular USB host controller is there, but clearly it is a USB host controller and it's got its own local oscillator as well, as you'd expect. And it looks like we've got some of the support circuitry for the external trigger input. There's an AD6 uh, and ADG633, that's an analog switch. We've got an AD8510, I believe that's a precision uh, op amp there. And we've got a good old 74 ACT series 08, go figure. And the front side of the board uh, trigger circuitry, we've got a TI uh, 594 there. I'm not sure, I assume that's like a, a 74594. And I'm not sure what this particular National Semiconductor device over here is. And we've got a Max 9202 here, which is a uh, fast quad comparator. And on the front side of the board here, one of those uh, devices, um, well, the one that's uh, populated anyway, I assume the other unpopulated ones are uh, the same. That's a, um, a Micron uh, SY89855. It's an LV Peckle Mux. And next to each one of the uh, MegaZoom 4 ASICs is a Samsung DDR2 memory. Uh, it's 512 megabits. And surrounding our uh, processor here, we've got our JTAG connector, of course, which is joined all together. We've got a 32 kilohertz uh, crystal for the real-time clock. We've got some uh, program memory surrounding that. And the uh, Xilinx 
Spartan FPGA with its configuration proms down here. And you can see the different bypass capacitor configurations here. This is for the Xilinx FPGA, and this one here is the ARM processor. Next to it, you can see that the balls are only around the outside there. They're not populated in the middle, so it's not a huge pin count. Well, it's not as large a pin count device as the FPGA over here. So there, it keeps the balls all the way around the outside there, which leaves room inside for your bypass capacitors and a nice big ground fill in the middle there. But the FPGA over here, it's chock full of pins and you've got to get like eight layers just to route all these uh, pins out on the different layers. And really it's only got room, a little thin slither that way and that way to mount your bypass capacitors in the middle. And then they surround it all around the outside like that, whereas you see they didn't have to do that one with the processor. And we've got an SMSC Ethernet network controller. And near our 10 megahertz reference crystal on the back, here's our uh, frequency synthesizer. It's an ADF4360, and it's a uh, integer divide by N type and it generates the uh, high frequency clocks required from the 10 megahertz reference oscillator. It's a volt and it uh, contains a voltage controlled oscillator as well. And up in the top corner of the board here we've got ourselves an additional 150 meg crystal oscillator. And on the back of the case here we have yet more beautiful shielding, these nice welded integrated standoffs. I love them but it looks like we have a big shielding plate over a board which has this ribbon cable and this is probably the uh, touchscreen controller up here would be my guess. So let's pop the hood on those and see what we've got. <laughs> Check this out, there's no board under there, it's just an extra shield for the ribbon cable. Look at that, beautiful, it goes all the way over to this uh, front panel uh, keypad board. So this is the uh, uh, keypad uh, cable with all the rotor encoders. That'll have its own processor on it. We've seen that in the 3000. So, you know, nothing really exciting going on there. I don't think I'll even bother to take out this whole uh, plate because it's messy. You've got to take the knobs off and it really becomes quite ugly. So yeah, nothing too exciting on there, but I do want to have a look at that puppy. And yep, this looks like the touchscreen controller board. We've just got uh, the data and power coming in here and uh, we've got one controller, we've got two controller chips here which go off through these flat flex ribbons through to the uh, uh, front panel down in there. They actually go right up over the top so they would be the uh, sensor interfaces for the various rows and columns there and we've got a main serial interface controller. Let's take a look in more detail. And there's the main touchscreen controller I see. It's from a company called EETI. They're a Taiwanese company that specialize in uh, these sort of uh, touchscreen controllers. And it's the EX5404. I can't get any details, uh, data sheet on that. You know, it's one of those proprietary, uh, you've got to contact them to get it. Pain in the ass, but there you go. We've got two of those uh, controlling this 12 inch touchscreen. And the main controller there is an EXC7200. And that's all she wrote, really. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, the architecture is the same as the 3000X. There's a few little uh, optional extras which weren't on the uh, 3000. And of course, uh, unfortunately, I can't take off the metal can. They are soldered um, down to the board. So this is a demo unit. It's got to go back. It's not like I can uh, uh, risk damaging this thing by taking those off. But uh, there's not much circuitry in the analog front ends. These are the 200 megahertz channels. Don't know why they've got red and green dots on them, part of the uh, testing process. I hope that one didn't fail. Mm. Um, so yeah, these analog front ends will be different uh, depending on the model you buy, right up to 1.5 gig, which the 3000X only went to one gig. So uh, these, this is the same for the 200 and the 350 megahertz model, and then the 500 megahertz model is different than the one gig model is different again and the 1.5 gig model is different again. So all those analog front ends are completely different. They uh, would have to swap the whole board in the unit when you send it back to the factory because I'm sure they're not going to solder off these cans and, and you know change circuitry under there. It's, it's just not going to happen. I mean this one is designed for uh, the three as a 350 megahertz front end. Aha, uh -huh. I did get this sucker to slide forward and lift up. Oh, look at that. Look, folks, we have a big fan guard. 
Ah, oh, beautiful. Sucks all the air in on this side, right over the power supply, and then right into the fan there. Ah, oh, fantastic. No pun intended. So that's actually quite a neat bit of work there. There's the power supply in there. So it sucks all the air in through one end here and funnels it all the way under there, out this grill here. And of course, this is covered on the back here. So then it's got nowhere to go, but out through the fan. Oh, let's have a look to see what we've got in here, shall we? Here's our uh, PCB mount IEC power input connector. We've got a uh, common mode choke there. There's no other, uh, there's no other uh, suppression or, um, or uh, power factor correction or anything on there. We've got a big power resistor there and what looks like a little, maybe a little bridge rectifier or, or an opto coupler up there. We've got our logic, our soft logic power switch. No, that does not switch in the mains. As you can see, it's, it, those traces go over to here, which then go into the uh, um, low voltage uh, side of the power supply. So it really is, yep, it's not a mains power switch, it's a soft standby switch. And it looks like we have a totally different supply to what was used in the uh, 2000 and 3000X. If we have a look at the mains input side here, here's the 240 volts in, and these two brown devices, they're uh, PCB mount fuses, and this is actually a PCB mount fuse as well. So they're not as easy to replace as a uh, regular glass fuse. And tucked away under there, we have some uh, filtering, some more common mode chokes, some more filtering there. So yeah, they've done the basics. So what we had before in the 2000 and 3000X was a lineage brand power supply, but they've uh, changed it. They've got uh, Artisan brand uh, power supply here, and it looks uh, you know, it looks first class quality, all the, all the elastic and all the, you know, the quality of the components. It really looks well laid out and well designed as you'd expect in an Agilent bit of test gear. Check this out. Someone's done an oopsie here. This uh, pot, I believe, yeah, it's a sealed pot by the looks of it, is uh, fouling this connector and I can't push that down any further. <laughs> it's lifted up on an angle there. Oops. And it's hard to see the brand of the cap in there, but I see Chemicon there. So that would be a Nippon Chemicon top brand capacitor, 105 degrees C rated. So that's quite a well-designed little uh, power supply. I don't mind that at all. And because it is uh, totally different to the 2000, 3000X, possibly we uh, have a lower standby power consumption than that horrible six watts we were getting last time. Worth a check. So there's only one thing left to do, and that's put this sucker back together. <laughs> Hope it works. And uh, no, sorry, the LCD under there, there's going to be nothing interesting on that. So, and the main uh, keypad controller board, pretty boring. Boring is the proverbial bat poos. And in case you wanted to know the power consumption, 81.3 watts while operational, not doing much of course, and uh, standby mode, it was uh, in the order of 6 watts on the 3000, it was an absolute shocker, so uh, it should be, if they've done everything right, it should be lower, and so this uh, thing averages, it takes some time, there we go, bingo, 2.1 watts standby, beautiful, one third of the 3000X. Still a bit high, but oh, geez, you know, you can still fly to the moon on two watts. So there you have it. I hope you liked that uh, teardown. If you want to see a bit more information, there is the uh, 3000X teardown as well, which I will link in. So if you like it, please give it a big thumbs up. That helps a lot. And if you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EV blog forum, because that's where all the cool nerds hang out. Catch you next time.